Let's turn to Mark chapter 11, verse 27. Mark 11, verse 27 through 33 as we finish the chapter. Kind of fun for me. And really, by whose authority? There used to be a saying around Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, when you would do something and you did not get authority to do it, Pastor Chuck would say, by whose authority did you do that? And you just kind of look at him thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, not yours. He says, no, I didn't give it to you. Who did it? And eventually I have to say, well, I just did it. Well, who are you? You're not the senior pastor. Do you answer it? No, I don't. By whose authority? In other words, you don't have the authority to do that. And then we know what Jesus said in the New Testament when the satyrian came and he said, boy, what great faith. And the man says, you don't need to come to my house to speak it and I will believe it's done. For I am a man who is under authority. I have one who is over me and there are those under me. So I'm a man who has authority, but I'm under authority. And that is the correct way to look at it. You will never in your life be without somebody being over you. You can say, well, I own my own business. Well, you have God. Well, I'm not walking with God. Then you have a wife. Period. That's it. Or vice versa. There's always going to be a business partner. There's always going to be somebody. So the problem I feel that we have in our generation is a rebelliousness towards authority. So we live our life seeking to get out from underneath of the authority. So we don't have to do that. And what happens is that's a very dangerous thing because we don't have accountability. And when you all of a sudden get out under authority and you have none, then you make some of the most horrific moments in your life because you have no checks or balances in your life. So God places those things in your heart. The Father, he says that Jesus submitted to the Father. He came to do His will and His will alone. I have meat that you know not of. That is my Father's will. I came in the volume of the book, and the book was written about me, to do thy will, O God. So in my life, I need to surrender to that authority. There's a cute little story I've told you before. Divert your course. This is the actual conversation of a United States naval ship with the Canada authorities off the coast. It says on October 1995, radio conversations released by the chief naval operation on 10 Canada, please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans, recommend you divert your course, sir, 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canada, negative, negative. You will have to divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. America, this is the captain of the U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canada, no, I say to you, divert your course. What's wrong with you? Won't you listen? Americans, this is an aircraft carrier, U.S. Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied with three destroyers, three cruisers, and a number of supporting vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. I say again, that one five degrees north or counter the measures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Canada, this is a lighthouse. I would tell you, change your course. <laughs> you know, well, guess who won? The lighthouse. So there's always going to be somebody telling you what to do. I change your course. No, why? I'm a lighthouse, you dingling. Change your course. And uh, kind of interesting. By whose authority? By God's authority. Well, why do I have to submit God's authority? Why do I have to do it that way? Because the Word of God says, whatever you do in word or deed, you do for the glory of God. And you do it with a hilarious heart. And you change your heart and you get right with God. And it's not everybody else. We have sinned and sinned only against God. And so I can't blame anybody. By whose authority? Because God said it in His Word. So if you come to a point in your life that you really get saved and you really made a mess of things and you come to a point that God has really forgiven you, and then you kind of really want someone to help you. And you finally get on the right side, and you don't want to fight that any longer. And I do believe, I said Sunday morning, that one of the great problems I think in life, probably 85% of us, is we try to pull this rock on our side. We spend our lifetime taking a rope and wrapping it around God and trying to pull him on our side. And we will never do it. David, 
the greatness of David, why David had a heart after God, was because no matter what happened in his life, he always went over to the side of God. He could blow it, commit adultery, he could murder. He still ended on the side of God. So why God said this man had a heart after me was because he didn't fight with God. When he fell, he got back up. He fell seven times, he got back up seven times. But he always went towards God. When he was in Ziglag, when he shouldn't have been there, and the Philistines and everything else and his family had been taken, and all his own soldiers were going to kill him, it says that David picked up, walked around, and all his men began to pick up stones to kill David. He said David began to encourage himself in the Lord. He began to say, like, God, if I die, who's going to be king? And God, I'm on the wrong side. I'll get over there right now. And so all of a sudden, that the men were so encouraged because David was talking to God. So when I start talking to God, my wife gets real happy. And when you start talking to God, everybody gets real happy. Because the greatest thing in your life is to yield your life to that authority. And so here, it might be wise here to start humbling ourselves and start listening once in a while. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Notice two things are going to be mentioned today in this passage. Number one, two major reasons why I need to really change my course or not interfere with what God's doing. In chapter 11, verse 27 and verse 28, he is the true shepherd. In other words, God is that true shepherd. They come again to Jerusalem as was walking in the temple. This is now the third time. Three times he checks on his temple. What's that tell you? In John chapter 2, he checked out the temple, and he turned it over. In Mark, you remember in chapter 11, he turned over the temple. And here, for the third time, he now is going to check it out. God will always check out your life. He's never going to give up because that temple is the key of your heart. It is your heart. So this is the third time he comes into the temple. And notice here, he mentions the chief priest, the scribes, the elders, saying to him, by what authority does thou these things? That's a good question. Who gave thee this authority? That's a good question, to do these things. And Jesus knew it was a good question. But what's interesting is who was asking it. And because of who was asking the question, it now changes the way that God is going to answer. If they had been walking with God, then he would have answered a different way. But because of the pride, because of the arrogance of these men, because of how radically ungodly these men were, Jesus was not going to answer them. He was going to challenge them with another parable. And he was going to challenge them to show exactly how their intellect was not working as well as they thought. When I come after God with my intellect, I'm going to lose every single time. It won't make sense. It's like speaking in tongues. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, why not? Because it does not, I, don't, I don't understand it. Well, do you understand electricity? No. Then don't turn on the lights when you go home. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Do you understand how a brake works when you step on the, you know, brake and all of a sudden you have a master cylinder and it, has, it goes to the drums and it shuts or the disc? Do you understand? No? Then don't step on the brakes. In other words, we have faith in everything else, but when it comes to God, we don't. And what he's saying here in a very profound way is that because the scribes were those that were basically uh, the ones who wrote and the ones who were the scholars, and then the priests and the elders, you should know. You do err, you do err not knowing the Scriptures. In other words, the mistakes you make is because you don't know the Word of God. And now you're going to challenge me when you should know that I'm your Messiah. You're looking for a Messiah that wants to build up a kingdom. But the Bible says the Messiah has to go to Isaiah 53 and be killed. You don't even understand that. Because you're so prideful and wanting people to worship you, I'm not going to answer you. I'll give you a question. You answer my question, I'll answer your question. And so they were game for it, but they couldn't answer his question. Because they're fighting with God, they're messing with God, and they're playing with God. And every time you're going to lose. And the second reason, not only is he the rightful shepherd, he's the rightful king. Notice in verse 29 through 33. Let me read this to you, and then I'll explain. And Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one question, and answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. They should know. Remember he said, I came in my own name, you received me not. Another is coming in his own name, the Antichrist, 
him will you receive. Verse 30, the baptism of John, which they all knew about, was it from heaven or was it from man? Answer me. And that's a great, great question. Because John's baptism was from heaven. And the reason they knew that is because they had to sacrifice, they had to wash their hands, they understood the cleansing effect in the temple. Verse 31, they reasoned with themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did we not believe him? But the conjunction, if we say, oh, it's from man, they, we fear man, fear the people, for all the people counted John that he was a prophet indeed. So they're caught. Every single time they're caught. Verse 33, they answered, and Jesus said to the Jews, they said to Jesus, we cannot tell. We're not going to tell you. Jesus answered, say to them, neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. And they walked away. So, first of all, there are questions I want answered that I might never get answered because I'm not right with God. The secret things are really belong to the Lord. But what more is important to me here is I want to teach you two things tonight that are really important. Number one, the danger of religion and the blessedness of a relationship. Sometimes we exalt a religion. It can be a Calvary Chapel. It can be the Catholic Church. It can be another thing. And the problem is, is that religion is a very brutal thing. There have been more killings by religion than anything else. You look at Islam. You look at the Crusaders. You look at some of the history. It's been one big bloody mess. Even the peasant revolt there in Wesley's day, it was terrible. So many priests were killed because of the peasants. They went crazy because they took the grace of God and went way too far. So whenever you allow people to begin to dominate, then you're going to have problems. So the Jews had a problem. They isolate, they kill, they destroyed so many things. We see Islam, we see the Crusaders, we see Hitler, we see people with a religion saying, listen, this is who we are. Religion is a dangerous thing. So number one, we don't want you here having a religion except a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion makes you do something. It makes you have to pay something. It makes you have to do something. When Jesus said, if you are saved, then that's all you need. On the thief on the cross, he didn't speak in tongues. Most churches say you have to speak in tongues. He didn't receive baptism. Most churches say you can't go to heaven unless you're baptized. He, he didn't witness. Hey, you can't go to heaven unless you witness. And he didn't even share anything. Didn't even pray. You can't go to heaven. Jesus said, if you believe, then this day you'll be with me in paradise. That's a relationship. Everything else is religion. So religion tells you I have to do all these things to be right with God. I have to read my Bible 25 times a day to get right with God. I have to do all these things as I'm going to go to hell. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now you are to enjoy yourself with God. And you should read till God speaks to you. You shouldn't have some plan that you are in there trying to fight through the book of Leviticus and it doesn't make sense because you're going to get weird. Read. If you don't understand, keep reading till God speaks to you and stop and let the Spirit of God minister to you. And all of a sudden you have to do this or you have to give this or you have to sacrifice this or you have to do all these things for God. No. You have to do one thing and one thing only. You have to learn how to abide in the vine. You have to learn how to stay really close to God. You have to learn not to look at people and to get all your energy and all your life from the vine. That's the key of your life. So if I am going to wither, it's because I've taken my eyes off of God. If I get away from that river, then once again, I'm in trouble. But if I plant my life at that river, then I'm going to have leaves and I'm never going to go weary in my life. So, number one, the danger of religion. But number two, the damage that's done. The damage that's done. I think a couple of things, really, I, I, I jot it down. It turns holy things into heaviness. It takes something that is so pure and so holy, and it makes it heavy. You have to do this. No, you don't. You have to be a leader. No, you don't. You have to give up this. No, you don't. Now, if you don't want to give it up, don't be a leader. 
If you want to be a leader, then sacrifice and be a leader. But if you don't want that, then don't do it. Well, can I do anything? You can do anything, but all things are not expedient. Can I have a beer? You can have a beer, but is it going to edify your family? No. Is it going to alter your mind? Yeah. Be careful. But I, but doing all that my whole life, I don't want to do that. I have chosen that I'm going to stay as close as I can. So it turns holy things into heaviness. Secondly, it turns spiritual things into shame. It takes the freedom and the grace of God, and it says that you can now not share with somebody else because you haven't been trained. Listen, if you are in the mall and someone is ministering or you see a friend and they need prayer, you pray. You don't stop and say, let me call Pastor Steve. You pray. If you don't know what to pray, say, bow your head in Jesus' name. You know, or carry a card. It doesn't make a difference. It's not you. It's them coming to God. All you're doing is connecting people. It says Philip was able to bring his brother, Peter, to Jesus. It says that, remember, Philip was able to bring the Greeks to Jesus. And Philip was able to bring the boy to Jesus. I mean, I mean Andrew, I should say. Andrew was able to bring Peter, and Andrew was able to bring the boy with the sack lunch. All he did was bring people to Jesus. That's a great ministry. And second, third, it turns joyful things into jail. I, now I had joy, now I had legalism. Now you can't do this, and you can't do that. And you can't have guitars, and you can't have music, and you can't do that, and you have to wear this, and you have to wear that. Now wait a second. Where does it say that in the Bible? It says that look at the heart, not the outward things. And then, number four, it turns worship into work. We've got to bring the glory down. Well, the glory's here. We've got to bring the will of God. The will of God's here, <laughs> you know. Well, I've got to hear God's voice. Just read the Bible out loud. You know? So I've I, I got to get to church. Open your Bible and let God speak to you. It's not going through the Bible. It's the Bible going through you. And then it turns heaven into hell. In other words, it was, it was the joy and the peace and, and the goodness of God that got saved. Now someone in the pulpit is saying, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And you've got to go to the retreat and you've got to be members of this church. And you better not leave us. We're going to call you. And you better not do that. And whatever you do, don't go to that church. Well, you better go to that church and check it out. See, it's like, are they teaching the Word of God? No. Are they sharing the Word of God? No. What are they doing? They're protecting their flock. Now, wait a second. It's not their flock. They're trying to keep their flock. Wait a second. It's not their flock. Jesus said, I bought this flock with my own blood, so be careful that you don't mess with it. They put pressure and burdens upon you. you know, this, is, this is your sacrifice. No. If God has not spoken to you, don't do it. Or I think you ought to marry this person. No. If you feel like you should, then so be it. But you don't do anything unless you have a conviction to do it. See, religion tells you this is what you have to do. I'm the Lord of your life. And Jesus said, I hate that. I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then the deadness of the, it produces. Number one, look at the Sanhedrin. It says in our passage here in verse 27, 28, and that's really the heart. Walking in the temple, he saw the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. I want to talk about that just for a second. The deadness. The Sanhedrins, they were the deadness of religion. They were basically the Jewish Supreme Court. There were 71. People say, no, there's 70. No, there were 71. There were 70, and the high priest was the number one. He was the president, just like in the Jewish country today. We have a president, and then there are those underneath of him, the cabinet. So there were 70. Out of those 70, they were lawyers, and they were priests, and they were some of the most elite people there were. They're called the high-ranking tribune. And they had among them the high priest as a president. They had scribes, they had lawyers, and they had elders. Now we know, we believe, Paul the Apostle was a Sanhedrin. And to be a Sanhedrin, you had to be married. And so we believe that something happened to his wife. That's why he understands marriage so well. We also know that Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin. And so these were brilliant men, and they were teachers, elders making up the Sanhedrins, ruling the council of the Jews. They were called the cabinet, and they turned people away from worship. These were the ones that Jesus said, listen, I never ask you to do this. You are the wisest, smartest people. You are filled with intelligence, and you have destroyed the work of God. He says you do err, not knowing the work. So be careful if you pride yourself on being intellect. 
Because if you become extremely in your mind, like I'm going for the higher education, that's fine. But if it kills your faith, if it makes you come to a point that you can't trust God, then it's not going to be wise. Because Jesus chose those that were weak. Not many wise, not many rich will make it into the kingdom of God. It's very hard to find somebody in the upper echelons of education that still have a heart for God. Because now they feel like they have an edge. And they begin to fight and counsel. And this is one of the dangers about apologetics. This is why I would never want that ministry. I, I love it. I like that stuff. But what do you do? You spend your whole life studying everything that's bad. Well, no. It'd be better to study what is right and let everything bad show up. But when you study everything bad, you become negative, And you're not studying the truth. And it happens all the time. So if you have that gift of apologetics, then make sure that you study the Word of God. And then, secondly, study some of the false things going around. But don't you dare go the other way around. Because it will destroy you and make you bitter and make you prideful. It has all the way down the road. You listen to it on the radio. You see them change right in front of you. And so the Sanhedrins were very, very dangerous people. And they once again got in the way. And then we find, number two, the Pharisees. The Pharisees. And I have a reason for this, a very important reason. The Pharisees. They showed hypocrisy in religion. So the Sanhedrins, they would show very simply that religion was dead. But the Pharisees showed that they were hypocrites or hip hypocrisy. They have no desire to please God. They wanted to be seen of man. It says in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, the Pharisees went forth straightway, took counsel with the Herodians against how they might kill him. In other words, they did believe in the Holy uh, the resurrection. They did have the knowledge of the word. It says, Paul, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. As touching the law, I was blameless. In other words, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, but he was blinded. He was now on his way to Damascus to kill people because he did not have the truth inside of him. He had it here, but on his side. In Mark chapter 16, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. So he's tagging the Pharisees. In fact, he says to the Pharisees, You are white sepulchers full of dead men's bones. That's pretty nasty. So Jesus, on two things, he says, Listen, I don't really want to talk to you. The Sanhedrins, you have taken... And I've made you the elite leaders of my country, and you have destroyed their faith. It's like professor, professors in schools. They take our children, and they turn our children away from God because of humanism. And secondly, you've taken people that have a great knowledge of the Word of God in the Bible, and yet they're blinded to everyday living. And they want people to bow to them. And they want to be seen of man. And they have no desire to please God. Get out of here. I don't want you either. That's what religion does. But somehow I'm attracted to this crazy stuff. It says in Matthew 22 verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him and talk. They sent out. In other words, they were sent out by the Sanhedrins to try to tryst. And with the Herodians. In other words, it was sick. The third group of people were the Herodians. Now pay attention because this is kind of cool. The Herodians, they compromised religion. They were the Jewish political group. They have them in Israel today. They were, in, they were united with the Sadducees. And I like that word Sadducees, sad you see. They, had no, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad you see, Sadducees. They were um, opposed to the Pharisees. They loved the dynasty of Herod. And it was the dynasty of the Herods that supported the Herodians. They believed in government control over everything. And they had no heart for the things of God. What's interesting, if you understand the Herodians or Herods, is that very powerfully they were the descendants of Esau. And they were called Edomites. And so every Herod is an Edomite. And every Herod, being an Edomite, means that he came from Esau, which means that he has no heart for God. He's out to kill everything that God has to do. And so they stood behind Rome. And you think, now wait a second, they were Christians. Well, there's a lot of Christians that are double-minded. There's a lot of people that say, hey, this is Christianity, but you've got to come with me because I have the mind. 
or there's people saying today, I have Christianity, but you come with me and you do what I tell you to because I'm going to control your life. And, and then there are people like this, listen, hey, just let's all just be one country here, you know, okay? And then we read in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and the Pharisees went forth, straightway took counsel with the Herodians. Why? Because the Herodians were tied into the Herods, and the Herods could get done what they had to get done. They could kill Jesus. So it was a plot. It was a full-on plot. So now you have religion. You have the Crusaders. You have Islam. You have over here, you have the, you know, the peasant revolt. It's all bad. You have killing witches. You have all this stuff. You have humanity really honestly destroying Indians. You have, you have slavery destroyed, 50 million. You have man out of control somehow in their brain thinking that they don't need God, and yet look at the damage we've done. See, that's religion. It's a religion. Well, we're all going to be white. We're all going to be black. Well, look, okay, let's all be white now. Look, okay, I got Hitler. Well, let's all be black. Now we've got, you know, Malcolm X and all the other guys, you know. And, you know well, let's all be Islam. Well, now you've got trouble. And then well, let's all be, you know, this. Well, now you've got real serious trouble. He said, what are you going to be? How about just being a Christian? How about not going down that road and having a relationship with God? And, and well, you know, I... Here it is. Did anyone have a relationship with Hitler? I don't think so. If he got mad at you, you're dead. But how about having a relationship with the living God? Would you like that? What about having a relationship with something, you know, no, you, you know, you don't want a relationship with a sword, and you don't want a relationship, you know, with someone that can destroy you with their mind. See, that's what religion does, and that's what we get caught in. Hey, I'm going to be a scholar. Oh, God help us. Is it a seminary or a cemetery? Now, you're going to say, well, how can you say that? I have my doctorate. So, no, stop. It's good. I learned some good things, but I learned one major thing. It, he that marries the widow of the future becomes the widow of the future. I, that's pretty good. But I learned a lot of things. But what I learned was I already knew it, that God spoke to me. But to go around and boast, that's pretty dangerous. And then he says in Mark chapter 12, Verse 13, they sent unto them certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in this word. Uh, it, wh no. Why would a religion want to catch Jesus? What did he do? Did he hurt anybody? No, he healed. Didn't he make more wine? <laughs> Didn't he raise the dead? Didn't he heal everybody that came? He walked on water. He put fish in the boat. What did he do? D did he hurt Rome? Did he? No, he paid taxes out of the fish's mouth. What did he do? Nothing. But they all knew that he was a king. He was a threat to their religion. That's why if you really have a heart to understand this, no one wanted to give up Judaism. Why? Because you're out of work. What do you mean Christ is going to come and that's the end? Who is going to sell the sheep? We have 120,000 sheep we kill every day of atonement. Who, we have slaves bringing them. We got woodcutters. Oh, that's gone. You're, it's like, I have eight track tapes. Oh, bless your heart. I have cassettes. Oh, bless your heart. What's left? I don't know. But you're just going to have to think it's going to be in your brain. So the moment you have a business, it's gone. Because new technology. That's exactly what happened. And so he's saying here, hey, the Herodians to say, hey, we're going to kill him. Why? And then, and the, number four, the, the Sadducees, my favorite, Sadducee. They show the weakness of religion. Why? Because they had no Holy Spirit. They, had, they didn't believe in the realm of the Spirit. They were materialistic. They did not believe in the resurrection. And that's how Paul got out of that great fight. He was with the Pharisees and Sanhedrin. He said, I'm, I believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees said, we believe in the resurrection. And the Sanhedrin said, we don't. And so the Sanhedrin and Pharisees got in a fight, and Paul snuck out. Smart man. But it says in Matthew 22, it says, Jesus answered, said to them, ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. You, you Sadducees, you're so sad and you're so deceived because you don't know the Scriptures. You don't look at them. You don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I'm trying to say, as I pull this together, it's going to make so much sense, is Jesus walked into Jerusalem and had to face all this. There's one more, and I'll bring it all together. The scribes. It says in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, one of the scribes came having heard 
them reason together and perceive that he had answered them well. Now he's saying that about Jesus. This is really cool. Ahead, ask him, which is the first? So he says, I'm Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? That's breathtaking. I mean, someone is actually asking Jesus a question. You know, it's like we get so afraid of people. <laughs> and we don't say nothing. But here's a guy, pretty good in who he is, kind of knows Jesus. Tell me this. I heard you talking, and it really made a lot of sense. Could you just tell me? Could you answer me who's the first? Verse 29, Jesus answered him. The first of all, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like unto thee, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the, these are the two great commandments. Verse 32, the, stri the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said truth, for there is one God, there is none other but he. Huh. So the scribe is saying, good job, Jesus, you did good. Verse 33, to love him with all the heart, now he's going to say something to Jesus, with all your understanding and with all your soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the burnt offerings and together. And Jesus said, hey, discreetly, he said unto him, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. No man after that asked Jesus any more questions. Now, you, Why? I'm going to give you a treat right here in Ezra to say where you are. But Ezra is one of the book in the Bible. He was a scribe and as a priest. Now listen to this. This is why the scribes were different. This is Ezra went up from Babylon. He was ready scribe. He was a ready scribe. That means he's ready. In the law of Moses, he's able, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord was upon him. He was in the Word, he was doing it, and God's favor was on him. Verse 10. For Ezra, now check out, this, this is a great verse for pastors. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, to teach it in Israel's statues and judgment. Verse 12. Alexerxes, the king of kings, unto Ezra, the priest, the scribe, the law of God, perfect peace, at all times with you. So here's a good priest and a good scribe. And so out of all the people, the scribes were probably the best because they were in the Word. Now here is how I'm going to tie this whole thing up, and I think it will make sense. Here's the conclusion. In Mark chapter 11, verse 27, they came again to Jerusalem. Two things tonight that I want to challenge you. Number one, I think it's real hard to come to Jerusalem because it's God's will. I think sometimes in our life we look at what is God's will in my life? Go to Jerusalem. There's a cross waiting for you. I, I think it takes great courage. I really do. I think that the thing that's lacking in our life and sometimes my life is the courage to do it. Like tomorrow, I have to have courage. I don't want to go. But it's the will of God in my life. So how do I address this? I mean, there are things that God wants you to do and you don't do them. There are things that God is speaking to you today and yet you're thinking, well, how can I do it? How can I do God's will? You have to have courage. It might be saying you're sorry. Or it might be changing your habit. Or it might be humbling yourself and realizing you don't have it all together. Or it might be confessing. Well, why don't people do that? Because they don't have courage. Well, why don't they have courage? Because they don't want to do God's will. You see, you have to put the courage and the will of God together. Because that's the cross. It's the cross is not some cross here with Jesus hanging on it. The cross is God's will and my will. That's the cross. And when the power of the Holy Spirit gets you, it says that he'll touch your mind, your heart, and your soul. And now, O oh Lord, thy will be done. I want to do your will. I want my mind to be transferred. And I want my heart to have your heart. So God, touch my heart, touch my mind, and touch my will. Because I, I, I want to do it but I don't have the courage because i got to give something up or do something. Well, that's true. Or I have to deny something, or I have, to, I have to humble myself and say, you know, I've been doing this thing for so long, I'm afraid. Number one, are you willing to face Jerusalem? 
if you know you're going to die, and you know that you have to go back to the temple and check it out, and you know these guys are waiting for you, do you want to go chase them? When I went to Oxford, I, was, I got a, two interesting phone calls in my life. One was from the White House asking me to come pray. And so I hung up because I thought it was a joke. And they called back and they said, no, this is really the White House. <laughs> okay, okay, I won't hang up. But I just, you know, you said, who called? Give me a break. Okay, second was I got a letter from Oxford Roundtable in Oxford, London. We like you to come join us at the round table. <laughs> okay? It's only foreign people in the whole world, we ask. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> okay. What's the gimmick? So, me being a trusting guy, I went to Azusa Pacific and asked, you know, the President John Wallace to check it out and see if it's true. So I knew it was a joke. I mean, there's always a, like a can't, you know, kind of that, not really that. They want to get you over. Uh, John called back and he says, this is really the round table. They really want you. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, did I feel qualified? No. Am I glad I went? Yeah. I've asked other pastors to go, but they won't go. Why? I've asked some really famous guys to go. They don't want to go. Why? Because they don't want to make a mistake. Well, if they're dumb enough to ask me, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to learn something. I mean, again, I mean, I, you think I'm real complicated. I'm pretty simple. If I'm going to go, I'm going to speak for God or I'm going to hear God. So I can't lose, right? So, the, and then the topic was intelligent design. It was just a joke, you know. But anyway, I went and bombed out the first day, went back to my room, cried, and was ready to hop on the plane. And God said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I quit. I, gee, those are heathens in there. Said, Why did I send you? <laughs> said, I'm going to have a cup of coffee with them. That's what you sent me. So at the end of a week, I built great relationships with them. And I just got another letter asking me to come back. So am I willing to go face the fears in my life? No, <laughs> but I have to. Am I willing to do the hospital? No, but I have to. Why? Because if I can help Kevin, and I can help myself, and I can help you, help my wife, i got to do it. And my wife just goes round and round and round chasing me with one ear. She's so tired. She's lost weight, but she, you know, I'm just like, a, what, what, what? Because <laughs> she knows when I give her my left ear, I, I ain't hearing nothing. I just kind of nod and all that. She goes, I'm going shopping. I spend all your money. Uh-huh, okay, no problem. <laughs> when I'm in trouble, she chases that right ear. So, but, you know, yeah. If I have to humble myself, then I go tell Gail, well, I'm going to die. Yeah, you're going to die. But face Jerusalem. Well, I, I just can't. I, 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 it's just not worth it. Yes, it is worth it. You've got to face Jerusalem. Jesus went to Jerusalem to die. Second, are you ready? It's so important. You have to have courage to face your enemies and to take them on. Not be afraid. But I don't feel adequate. You never will. And honestly, you really don't have the ability to. They can outthink you and outdo everything about you. But when you open your mouth, you will send a sword through their heart. They can't protect it. They don't know relationship. They don't know what forgiveness is. And though they can be brilliant, and though they can get, say things and impress you, you, in your insecurity and your total fear, all you got to do is open your mouth and stutter and everything else, but what comes out will be a knife and a sword because his word will not return void. That's what we have to have, courage. Not be afraid. So with my staff and myself, hey, we're going to face Jerusalem. We don't know what's ahead of us. But number two, no man is going to stand against us. We'll stand against any man at any time, at anywhere. And we'll stand in the name of the Lord because you come to me in the name of your God, the Philistines, and you are nine foot nine. And yeah, I'm a flea and a dog, but I'll tell you what, in the name of God, your head's coming up. Boom. 
And he took five stones, not because he was going to miss, but Goliath had four brothers. He's going to take all five of them out. But before that, he had to take a lion out and a bear out. So that's what you're doing now. You're taking bears out, you're taking lions out. You look bloody, you look a mess. Okay, that's cool. But you're seeing victory in your life. Victory, courage, courage. And if our hearts condemn us, we have one greater. But if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence towards God that we can stand. And we not, might not be the best, but because God has called me and because God has chosen me, then God will take my water and turn it into wine. And he'll turn it in your heart and turn it around and he'll slice the back of you and he'll get you every single time. That's the word of God. That's kind of cool. Amen? So, so that's the study. The, all these people came against Jesus. Fine. But he faced them. I need to learn to face them and not be afraid.